That's a great turnout. I'm yeah, so glad we've got all these people. Um, Carolyn contacted us, I don't know when, a few months ago, uh, and had a little bit of information about an ancestor. We started doing some digging, and I contacted Carolyn and said, oh my God, get on newspaper.com, you've got a bonanza here. So she did all the rest of the research, and she's here from Colorado on some family business and decided to swing by here. This beautiful quilt has a wonderful story behind it. I'm not going to give it away. Uh, her ancestor, however, did own a piece of property, more than one in Great Falls. She will get to that. And this morning, Carolyn and I went to the place where the property is. It's now a coffee shop. And we had coffee and communed with her ancestor's spirit. <laughs> so it was really fun. So I'm going to let Carolyn tell you her story, and there you are. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Diane. If we keep phones silenced, and if we're speaking up again, we need to speak loud for her. Well, a quilt can tell a lot about the woman that made it, and I never dreamed all that I would learn about the person that made this quilt. So I grew up in southeast Nebraska, uh, near Geneva, Nebraska. Any Nebraskans here? No. <laughs> and uh, my grandmother passed away in 1946, and this quilt was in her cedar chest. And it came to my room, upstairs room in our house, and I didn't know it was there, and it was there for 40 years. And then, and my mother died in 1968. If anyone knew anything about the quilt, it would have been my mother. So uh, she didn't reveal anything before she passed away. In 1970, I moved to Colorado Springs, and a friend coerced me into becoming a quilter. I thought it was just little old ladies that sat around church basements <laughs> stitching by hand and that was not going to be for me. Well, about 50 or 100 quilts later, I'm still a quilter, so I did get hooked on quilting. So when my dad brought this quilt to me in a, in a sack in 1986 and he said, here, you, you might as well, as well have this. And I knew I had a treasure because I knew something about quilting at that point. And I said, Dad, who made this? Where did it come from? He said, it was in your grandmother's cedar chest. And uh, all I know is she used to take it to the county fair back in the 30s and 40s. And it uh, got wet on the back because the building leaked. So that's all I knew. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the quilt, of course. Your, I <coughs> hand carried it up here so you could uh, see it. So my 40 year, uh, quest to find the maker of this quilt began. And, uh, I'll just mention a little bit about crazy quilts. They were popular in the 1880s to about the 1920 at the latest. Uh, I think World War I kind of could put a kibosh on uh, fancy work and things like that. Uh, ladies of Means usually made them and they were uh, <coughs> to display in their parlor as uh, to show off their sewing skills. So uh, this is all hand embroidered. Uh, it was never finished, uh, and you'll probably, I'll tell you why later, but uh, <clears throat> there are some very elementary uh, embroideries on it. There are some uh, beautiful ribbon work and uh, embroidery with uh, threads that I was surprised existed back in the 1880s. So, this is whom I assumed made the quilt, was a lady like this. 
and the only clues were her initials, or I assumed they were her initials, J, Q, and A. And then Harris of Helena. And this, uh, I believe, was a lining for a hat, and it was used in the quilt. So I assumed it was made in Montana, but that's all I knew to start with. Uh, I was all, I've also become sort of an intermediate genealogist. I don't consider myself an expert, but I, uh, I started searching, and of course, back in uh, the 1980s, 90s, we didn't have all the computer uh, aids that we have now. So I, I knew my grandparents were David Maddox and Cora Richards. And I knew a lot about the Richards family because they still lived around my hometown. And I knew that uh, my great-grandmother Cora only had one brother. <coughs> so I was pretty sure it didn't come from the Richards family. I concluded that it probably came from the Maddox side of the family. And as far as I knew, my great-grandfather, David Maddox, had no siblings. He had <clears throat> uh, five daughters. One of the oldest was my grandmother. And he had four other granddaughters, or daughters. So one of them we had kept in close contact with so I wrote to my Aunt Amy, great Aunt Amy really, and asked her if she knew anything about this quilt. <clears throat> she said Aunt Jenny probably made the quilt, but she didn't know Aunt Jenny's last name. <clears throat> she thought Je Aunt Jenny owned land around Great Falls, Montana. She knew she had an adopted son named Clifford and a land manager named Mr. Wagner. <clears throat> and that Aunt Jenny died of an appendectomy in Lincoln, Nebraska before Aunt Amy was even born. So that's all she knew. It was Aunt Jenny. So I, I made a little progress. I knew it was Aunt Jenny that made the quilt. <laughs> Remember Aunt Amy, because she becomes important later on. <clears throat> so in 2006, I wrote this Great Falls Genealogy Society, and I, just with a hip whim, I said, can you find a Jenny that owned land around Great Falls in about two, uh, 1900? And I received a letter from John Burkholz, is he around? John has gone on. Mm -hmm. okay. He was a wonderful researcher. Yes, he was. So he sent me a list of 19 Jennies <laughs> <laughs> that own land around here in about that time. And the one on top of the pile, the alphabetically, the one that I should have picked up on <laughs> was the one that uh, I was looking for. But I just kind of laid it aside. You know, I was raising a family. I was busy with other things. I did go to the LDS library in Salt Lake City at one point. And again, they think you're crazy when you just ask for Jenny <laughs> in Great Falls. I wrote to the Nebraska Vital Statistics um, where she died. And they said, sorry, we didn't do death certificates until 1904, mm -hmm. and she had died in 1903. So there was no, I thought maybe in some little book someplace in Lincoln, Nebraska, there was her last name, <clears throat> but that didn't work either. <clears throat> As computer programs came along, I started researching the Maddox family on ancestry and family tree and looking for my great grandfather and anything I could find about him. That's going backwards. What did I hit? Oh. Okay. 
So last summer, I was sitting around bored one evening and I, on Facebook, I got an offer for a week of newspapers.com for free. So I thought, what the heck, I'll just subscribe for a week and then I'll cancel it. And so I put in my great grandfather's name and this top uh, clipping came up. J.M. Powers, public administrator, has been ordered by the court to pay from the estate of Jenny Allen, deceased, the sum of $50 to, and there's my great grandfather's name, David O. Maddox. So I had a connect, I had a last name finally between my great grandfather and Jenny Allen, who made the quilt. So the J and the A on the quilt are her initials. I still don't know what the K stands for. I assume it's her middle name. Then I also, and this was in the uh, Great Falls uh, paper in 1903 when she died. And then the other clipping was from my hometown paper and it said D.O. Maddox has the finest quilt this carrier number two has ever seen. I assume it was the mail carrier. Uh, it's made of silks and I can't read all that, but it, to be, it's worth $50 and is all silk. <laughs> so he had the quilt. Uh, she went to Nebraska to have surgery from up here. I assume maybe there were better hospitals, medical facilities in Nebraska, and she would be near her brother to have surgery. So uh, she uh, passed away after this surgery, and uh, the quilt evidently stayed in Nebraska. She, if she brought it with her at that time, it stayed in Nebraska, or someone up here uh, mailed the quilt to my great-grandfather. Oh, I keep going. Oh, okay. So, uh, I went on to, I don't remember if I went on or Diane told me, but anyway, I found the 1900 census for Great Falls and I am sure you can't read it, but uh, Jenny was listed on the 1900 census in a boarding house over on 2nd Street. And uh, there were four other girls uh, that were living with her in the boarding house. So, I then, uh, I don't remember how all this happened because it was, <laughs> it was a whirlwind with, between Diane and me. Uh, I found on uh, or uh, Ancestry.com her obituary and uh, <clears throat> says the body of Jenny Allen, better known as Nell Raymond, who died several days ago in a hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska will arrive in the city at four o'clock this morning and funeral services will be held at George's undertaking room at two o'clock this afternoon. Intermet will be made in Highland Cemetery. Richard Covert of Grand Rapids, Michigan, a nephew of the deceased, will accompany the remains to the city. It has not been learned whether or not the dead woman left a will. Well, she did. <laughs> uh, it is known to have been her intention to leave the bulk of her estate to her nephew. And that's wrong too, it was her son. And she had also expressed a purpose of dividing the residue of between her brother, a resident of Geneva, Nebraska, and her adopted son. She also had another brother and sister, and that's where the covert uh, 
nephew came from. Uh, let's see. The adopted son, a boy whom she adopted when his mother committed suicide several years ago in one of her houses. The estate consists of all the houses on 2nd Street from the 2nd Avenue South to the 1st Alley South of that avenue, besides some houses to the rear of those, and a ranch and stock near Evans. The estate is believed to be free of encumbrance and is worth probably $25,000 at least. That's $816 and such in today's uh, he did end up in the reformatory several times and uh, seemed to be in a lot of trouble until he married some uh, second wife who was a German and I think straightened him out and they moved to Seattle in 1922 and he became a longshoreman and I found nothing about him in the Seattle papers so Presumably, he uh, led a clean life after he moved away from Great Falls. <laughs> Nell hand wrote her will at, at the age of 37. I assume she knew she was dying she supposedly had five large tumors. Uh, so uh, her estate was embattled in the courts here for years. Uh, the railroad was buying up the land in the red light district and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but she uh, did leave her two brothers and sister each $50 <laughs> and my great-grandfather bought land in South Dakota with his $50. <laughs> so I'm going to just move through some of the slides. Uh, this one is ribbon embroidery on the blue. I forgot to mention that she listed her occupation as a dressmaker in 1900 on the census. So that makes sense that a lot of these embroideries and uh, pieces of fabric uh, came from her dressmaking business, if she in fact really had one. <coughs> she certainly didn't make 800 and some thousand dollars making dresses. <laughs> these are just traditional uh, stitches used on crazy quilts. A lot of the threads are a velour uh, type thread. This is pro cotton. Now I think that she had some of the girls or maybe even her son doing some of the work on that's in this quilt because it it's very elementary. It uh, does not look like uh, the advanced work that uh, most of the embroidery is. So I assume maybe if the girls weren't busy in the house, they were embroidering for her quilt. These are others. A lot of these were kits that could be bought through um, magazines like goodies magazine and some of the others would have advertisements and then you could send off and get a piece of fabric and a pattern to uh, put into your crazy quilt so it, it was so very popular and <coughs> these are some of the embroideries She liked roses and she embroidered a lot of roses on the quilt. Uh, she, 
there's quite a lot of ribbon embroidery on it so there uh, the flowers are just done with a let's see I can't tell if those are ribbon or not until I get up close uh, this is done with velour threads the Oddfellows uh, logo is there on the left one So lots of French knots on the left. That looks like Nebraska State Flower of the Goldenrod, but it's white, so I don't know if it is or not. <laughs> this is ribbon embroidery. They're, they're just straight stitches done with ribbon. These are more ribbon embroideries. And this is uh, the pig blossoms there are, are ribbons. Uh, they also did a lot of painting on crazy quilts. So this is, these are painted flowers that uh, I don't know if it I assume she did the painting. Is there another painted? This was a, a lily, I presume, that it's painted. The paint has cracked quite a bit on that one. <laughs> the quilt is in amazingly good shape since uh, it's 120 years old. These are photos of the back of the quilt. I said it had some water damage. Uh, so she didn't finish it because she probably, she died before uh, she got to it. Uh, she was only 37 and uh, so it would be nice if it had been finished. I've thought of doing it, but I think it's too fragile to, to mess around with very much. A few of the silks have shattered the uh, reds and the browns uh, don't hold up well because of the uh, iron in the dyes that they used. So remember I told you to remember uh, Aunt Amy. I'll talk about uh, Professor Moynihan in a minute. but. Uh, <coughs> Aunt Amy that gave me the very first clues that told me that Aunt Jenny made the quilt. Uh, <clears throat> after I finished all this research last fall, I uh, <clears throat> thought I would get in touch with Aunt Amy's daughters who still live in Nebraska. They're a little older than I am. And one was in a nursing home with uh, dementia, so I couldn't tell her the story. But uh, the other one I traced down through Facebook and, and such. And uh, I started, well, we chit chatted about family and such. And then I started to tell her this story about the quilt. And she said, oh, was she the one that ran the whorehouse in Montana? <laughs> <laughs> and I just dropped my phone. <laughs> because the family knew that she was a prostitute, but it was never passed down to <laughs> Now that I know that Aunt, Na Aunt Amy knew it and her daughter knew it, <clears throat> I'm assuming that my grandmother and my mother knew it, but they did not want to <laughs> admit it. <laughs> And then she went on to tell me that her grandpa Maddox wanted to move out here to Montana, <clears throat> but great, her grandma was afraid that Aunt Jenny would put the five daughters to work <laughs> in her houses, her businesses. So I was just shocked that, <laughs> that uh, the family did know this. Then Diane told me about Professor Jay Moynihan, 
who wrote books about uh, Montana prostitutes. And, <coughs> excuse me, uh, so she didn't mention whether uh, he was still alive, but I thought, I'll track him down and see if he is alive and see what he has to say because uh, <coughs> His book, Red Light Revelations, had no mention of Jenny Allen or Nell Raymond in it. And I thought, why not? <laughs> because I found so much information. And uh, <clears throat> so I uh, asked him and he said, well, the prostitutes moved around a lot and they changed their names a lot. Well. Jenny did neither one. She was here from at least 1893, probably until 1903 when she died. <clears throat> but, uh, and she seemed to use the same name as far as we know. So uh, maybe someday he'll revise his book and put Jenny Allen in it. <laughs> so, uh, I decided to contact Nebraska again, uh, the Department of Vital Statistics back there, because uh, <clears throat> I thought, well, I had been told that they had some older records before death certificates. And I thought, well, maybe they wrote in a book someplace something about her death in Lincoln. So I uh, <clears throat> harassed them quite a bit and sent them money. and. Uh, Finally, I did get a record, uh, and I don't think I put it in here. No. Yes. Go back. Sorry. So I did, uh, just a couple months ago, get a death certificate that had been on microfilm back in Lincoln. It said practically nothing. She was born in America. <laughs> and uh, so it didn't help me at all, but at least I had the satisfaction of knowing that I, I did get her death certificate. Uh, so I thought that a genteel lady of of high class, <laughs> made my quilt, and this is uh, what I found was the maker of my quilt. I just <laughs> took these photos from his book. He's also published cookbooks. Did you all know that? <laughs> <laughs> the Good Time Girl's Guide to Gold Rush Cuisine. <laughs> the Prairie Pioneer Prostitutes Oven Cookbook. Mm -hmm. Uh, culinary delights from the red lights. <laughs> so, uh, anything to make money, I guess. Oh, I, and I, I did add the death certificate. But, uh, cause of death was fibroid tumors of the groin due to a laparous sec anyway, operation. <laughs> uh, I wondered if she did have a, a trans a sexually transmitted disease uh, to die at age 37. Uh, we'll never know. Aunt Amy said it was a burst appendix, but uh, the paper said five tumors. So yes, this is the lady I thought that made, <laughs> assumed made my quilt. <laughs> and it was someone like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I just like to close with a. Oh, I'll tell you, I did have the quilt appraised in 2005. It appraised for $1,300, which I thought was a lot of money then. Uh, I had it reappraised just last week by the same lady. She appraised it for only $1,800 which sort of made me sad <clears throat> because she had all the story that goes with it now. 
but she said uh, antiques are just not selling right now. It's it's a bad market. So uh, I feel in my heart that I want the quilt to end up here. I'm not ready to part with it yet, but uh, I'm meeting with the museum, the history museum tomorrow, and we'll see what they say about uh, taking it eventually, because it has a great fall story that's wonderful. <laughs> so what is life? A crazy quilt, sorrow and joy, grace and guilt, with here and there a square of blue for some old happiness we knew. And so the hand of time will take the fragment of our lives and make one of life's remnants as they fall, a thing of beauty after all. So that's my story. <laughs> and I'm hoping you have questions or additions to my story. That, uh... Carolyn, I just, I just want to point out that, oh, that um, Carolyn is giving us uh, a wonderful copy of the book that she has put together. And there are lots and lots this, this is the fun part. Lots and lots of copies of newspaper articles that detail the things like the shootings and beatings, all the fun things that went on. <laughs> uh, fights between girls who were hauled off to jail and fought yes. between jail cells with one another. Yes. All in wonderful graphic language and detail. So this book will be here. So if you get a chance please come up and spend some time. I know Elisa took some time, poured herself a glass of wine, I think, and, <laughs> <the evening. laughs> and I, I think it was well worth it, wasn't it? Yeah, so yeah. this book will be here. And, uh, the name of the book? Pardon? The name of the book? The Jenny Allen Crazy Quill. So we will have it here in the library. And it'll so. be placed on a shelf right over, almost by Diane. Diane, if you go right around the corner. Right around. Yeah, the that way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And be there's, great there's family history. stories, great falls people, family stories there, and that's where it will be. Yeah. And so, no, no, it will not be checked out. Yes. You have for sale then? You? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just I printed them on my own uh, printing machine at home, and only printed uh, ten copies, and I've given a couple to family members, several to family members. So, uh, I think I may reprint it. It, with a few additions that I've, I've learned along the way. Uh, <clears throat> does anyone know anybody in the Allen family that lives here? I was contacted by a Karen Miller that said she grew up here and rode the school bus with Allen family people, but uh, it wouldn't be Jenny's uh, descendants, it would maybe be her ex husband's descendants. Yes, and the other thing is, is there's two spellings of Allen early on. Here. Oh. There's an A L L I N, and it stayed around for a long time. Oh. They had kids in schools. Oh, okay, and so and there's quite a few Allens, A L L E N. Huh. But okay. we could, you know, just looking at it, you know, one of the things to look at would be looking in the school census books, Diane or Clifford. Looked. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying yeah. to find. Yeah. No, I, I checked school census records. Rats. I, I kind of have a feeling he got his education at the boarding house, maybe. I, <laughs> but I couldn't find any, any school I census records. So. I have one question. Yes. Anywhere in what you found, was she ever referred to as a madam rather than a prostitute? No. No. And, and that, that's surprising to me. Well, a lot of a lot of the ladies in that profession put down their uh, occupation as seamstress. Yeah. But but we have later records where the girls, in, like in the twenties and thirties, were rounded up. I was telling Carolyn this morning. I'm sure it happened then. They were rounded up once a, a month by the local police. And we have a docket book from a later time. 1912 docket book. Was it 12? Yeah, yeah, it was after her time. But they were rounded up once a month, taken to the police station, booked, 
and find. The madams were fined, usually 10 or $15, and the girls five, and all their names were recorded, and then they were released. I'm sure the madam paid for everybody, and it was just a money maker for the city. So they rounded them up, but they were listed as prostitutes yeah. on there. And that's a wonderful old book to look at, too. <laughs> they did that clear from the 50s. Right, right, yeah. So it was all it was all officially recorded. I mean that's that's what they were. And the whole south side from Second Street South from like Second Avenue South all the way down to Tenth Avenue was was and she's got a copy of the map here and on Third Street also. If you're just looking at loaded that. with these little boarding houses. Female so, boarding houses you, they were called. You can, you'll see them described as being on Rosebud Alley. <laughs> uh, Jenny paid a $300 liquor tax at one point, and I don't know if that was all liquor. That would have been a lot of liquor to sell. <laughs> I mean, $300 tax. A $300 tax. So I don't know if some of that was. <laughs> just she also a, owned some lots we found in in uh, Belt. Uh huh. Probably. And a, a ranch. Probably no one's going on in the city of Belgium. Uh, this one says it's the first, something January 1st, 1912 to October 14, 1913. And one of the policemen in this town, who shall not be named, but all the booking books were taken out to the garbage oh, yeah, where we were, good. and they were covered up, they were dumped and covered up, and he managed to save one and slipped it to us. And Jenny was very industrious. She home, actually homesteaded. That's how she yes. got the property yes. out in Evans. So, yes, yeah, the land patent details. That uh, she was quite ambitious. Quite a, a business. Yes, business. I don't know where she got her money to start with. That's that's a. Page four here. Yes. Numbers 114 through 151 on one page are all recorded as prostitutes. <laughs> Paying. That was March 31 of 1912. And it records their address and tells you that they're either, oh, most of these were pretty high class because it's five, 10, and $20. And <laughs> <laughs> here they are. There. <laughs> Yes. The Monahan that you read, what was the first name of that Monahan? J. J A Y. And that's a man? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. And the Charles Wagner was, uh, I believe, a lawyer here. It's W E G N E R Wagner. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I knew he was the caretaker, but I. Yeah. Didn't yep. Yeah. Well, you ladies are all aware of Leo Lamar, aren't you? Very, very, <laughs> very, very much. I would... In fact, I just ran into his death certificate in the 60s. Uh, in Great Falls, uh, and his daughter-in-law right before that, and his son who also died in a bad car accident in town here. Mm -hmm. But yeah. And on the map it shows the Death female, certificates got them all. female boarding houses, and some say color. Oh, yeah. yeah. so there's a map in the book. The one who, who killed her son? Oh. 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 Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I did mention John Whitted. I don't know if any of you knew any, know anything about him. He appears to have been a big time businessman that took over the leases uh, and operated the fashion saloon on Nell's property after her death. And it was amazing what he was paid. I can't find right now. He was paid huge amounts of money to Rents for business, well, at least the saloon, for until the estate was settled and everything was sold. And we couldn't find any listing for the fashion saloon. Yeah, it, <laughs> only in that one article. Uh -huh. So, huh. did you have any information about um, who did the work to homestead the ranch? This is a lot of work that goes into a homestead. I have just the land patent details. I don't. Your research didn't show who she hired to. 
Uh, Roger. No. <laughs> Somewhere it shows who she sold the land to. You, would you have did she it? leave it in her estate? Yes. Mm -hmm. No, I know. I just thought maybe she ran across the name. I know there's no documentation. Yeah, it's not legal. Yeah. No, but you can't. But you know she was that. busy downtown. But so she is <laughs> not <laughs> homesteading that property. But what you can do with that homestead that's interesting, you bring up something really interesting about that because you can get a hold of the homestead documents and in there when she proved up, she had to have at least two. They usually listed three, but she had to have two witnesses that were queried separately by the land office as to what they knew about her, uh, what she'd done and what she'd been able to put together. So that might give you valuable information. Structures? And wasn't Piano Jim Burnham involved? He, yeah. he was involved with her on the land. Right. Too, oh, yeah. He owned it for a while and then they they sold it. Yeah. He owned the land that she wants to Yes. Well, it kind of went back and forth. Yeah. It was hard to follow. Yes. So he was probably involved. Yes. Diane, during your research, do I remember you saying something there was a beat connection at one point? Well, well, there was a there was a, a odd thing. Um, we found reference to Jenny in a like a commemorative Fort Benton newspaper that talked about when she was in Fort Benton and what a great kind-hearted gal she was. <laughs> and then um, there was one article. She died in December of 1903. Right? January. Jan. Okay, well, after after her death, a small article appeared in the either the Anaconda or Butte newspaper that said the hearing for Jenny Allen is, uh, whatever the detail is scheduled for, and it gave a January date, but it was after she had died. But we kind of, my theory is that the hearing had been scheduled, and then they didn't know that she had died. But obviously, she must have had something going on in Butte, too. So we know she was Fort Benton, Bell, Great Falls, and I don't know, maybe on the ranch she had something going, too. Who knows? But I, I do have over here also the typical questions from the homestead era, from another homestead that I've saved here, that has the questions that were queried of the witnesses so you could see, you know, who might have known her business. You'll also notice in the newspaper when she proved up in the newspaper at least five times in the newspaper at intervals there were things saying that here were the witnesses she was going to use it'll name them all they're not necessarily in the record but i've got one here from my great uncle and it's right from that same period of time and the questions are exactly what got put together on that place according to that witness and they were all queried separately no. So you could send your goals to it. Where would I send? Oh, we can. I, I think can help you with that. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes, you can. I have all afternoon. Yes. <laughs> Nothing better. And they're open again. The good news is, is that the government land office records in Washington, D.C. are open again, officially. You know, they've been closed for almost two years. But they are open again. I believe the fee is about fifty dollars. There, it was before pre. It was pre-COVID. It was fifty dollars to get it. But I'll show you how to get it. Okay. <laughs> Be good. How many acres? Structures. What was planted? What yeah. was stored? Granary. Yeah, also. and everything is queried separately. You know what? What do you know about this person? Did you have any interest? in the land and getting it. They had to swear that they had no interest in getting the land. They had no, they had nothing other than that. They were neighbors or whatever. And that's why I like to get these is you're gonna find your relatives in here. Although, probably not her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you so Thank much. You. I'm sure a lot of people